right okay hi there it's um it's matt here um i've been putting this one off for some time actually but i've decided that now is the time to to sort of face up to this and it is it is my current metaphysic and what 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 that is and you know i, I just square with you right right at the outset that um I'm not exactly certain, so, but I'm, but I'm still, I am still because I think there's a there's a certain kind of um, sort of laziness that's crept into my thinking because, uh, you know, finding idealism so attractive. But the thing is, for me, that's it's not a recent phenomenon. It's something I've, you know, intuited for a long, long time. It has some sort of childhood-like insights into the nature of consciousness, and you know it would square with some of those. Also, um, read Berkeley at university to some level of detail, and you know warm to his position. Although there were some strange absurdities in his, you know, the idea of God maintaining the you know, continuity between separate experiences and things like that. To, you know, so it's like Matrix style. You know, um, but you know, so I've always had kind of idealist leanings um with or without Castrop and co right i mean i think what what i found so refreshing about Castrop was his um well just sheer enthusiasm for kind of you know trying to defeat materialism as a as a paradigm right and i think i pretty you know i think he's done a pretty good job on that um i, I mean i'm not sure whether he necessarily had to <laughs> to do it but he certainly popularized the um the notion that materialism is not answering some of the deeper questions so he's done as a massive service in that, and so he kind of he, he did kind of reignite my interest in philosophy writ large, as well as my um, help to reinforce my position on idealism. Um, obviously, you've got the likes of Hoffman um, adding to this journey, um, but you know Castro has you know been a, a pretty important figure in all of this. Um, so you know, so 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 what is what is idealism for some of um, you know any listeners out there that are not sure what, what, what the hell I'm talking about <laughs> let's sort of take a step back and say what is idealism so you know the clues in the name idea um, you know ideation thought mentation it's the notion that the cosmos is made of mind right so you know um, to those that the, the unacquainted will sort of look at that and say well that kind of sounds a bit insane because it kind of certainly looks as though we're surrounded by solid material objects and so on. So, you know, what is that? And also, of course, um, the account given of life and the emergence of um, intelligent beings such as ourselves. You know, we emerge from a kind of like basic non-intelligent place, right? That's that's the kind of, you know, broad brush position of materialism that, um, uh, you know, um, consciousness is some sort of epiphenomena emergent from the interaction of uh, material things, processes and so on. And I, you know, I mean, first of all, you know, I'm perfectly happy to accept that it, that, that, that account of materialism might might be flawed, but that's that's broadly the position I would suggest, right? The universe is made of stuff. Idealism says, well, no, 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 no. The the, the universe is just pure mentation, right? And there's a few kind of um, you know fairly obvious arguments that are used up front to sort of defend that position or sort of shore that position up. And one of those is that. Well, first of all, there's this sort of common sense approach where you say, well, nothing other than experience has ever been ex <laughs> experienced, right? There's a certain sort of, sort of, you know, sort of anti or a tautological kind of <laughs> um, issue there, perhaps. But I, I think that um, y you know, it's fair to say that we don't know anything other than experience, right? So there is this kind of um, additional um, ontological substance being added in by materialism, which which is the, um, the existence of this matter stuff. Yeah, because 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 obviously, as you know, Hoffman, Castro, and all these other guys are saying, we only deal with representations of um, things in themselves, as as Kant would would suggest, right? And and the idealist says, well, um, those those things that are being represented, they are also um, mental processes, right? And that's certainly the the account that sort of Castro seems to to give. So, and he uses this term um, dissociated boundary. So there's this idea that the entire universe is made up of these, uh, you know, interconnected sort of minds, right? That, that are kind of dissociated off from the mind at large. This is that's where you'll hear this mal thing, right? And I, you know, I, I might be picked up on this, but I think mal is essentially the kind of the god of monotheism, really. 
and I think that's where you know that's why idealism kind of opens the door to, to sort of mysticism and and potentially even religion as well and it looks sure looks like it um really sort of philosophically you look at the Upanishads and all of the modern monotheisms and stuff you'd say well you know they're putting forward a kind of idealist like position that the universe is one big kind of spirit mind thing you know like uh and that kind of looks like god to me right i know there's loads of tons of different sort of um you know nuance kind of shades of meaning and you've got pantheism and panpsychism and you know um you know but fundamentally what they're saying is that the the universe is kind of spirit right that's the that's the fundamental stuff of it i mean god is spirit yeah and um <clears throat> You know, I mean, I don't know about that stuff, but I mean, the, but the reason I still hold, you know, broadly speaking, an idealist position, is that um, <clears throat> well, materialism can't account for consciousness, right? It just, I, I just don't think it can. I don't think it's even possible that it can, and that's the, you know, that's that's why mm -hmm. it's such a hard problem, um, because it's it's hard to even kind of actually formulate the problem. Yeah, um, and again, that's probably something to do with the fact that you know we've only ever actually experienced visceral experience. We can't directly interact or apprehend stuff out there. And again, so this is the thing of saying, well, you know, the idealists would say, well, it's parsimonious to suppose there isn't anything else out there. Why should we, in, you know, add new um, ontological substances? Um, well, all we all we have ever dealt with is red yellow black you know combinations there two different forms of these i mean that's an interesting one isn't it? it's like well what are what is form right what is the form of a shape and actually what you might say is it's something to do with the extent of color isn't it so that the, the color is limited by other colors yeah so so there's this sort of kaleidoscopic sense to uh, or kind of um context the way we we sort of receive the world and um yeah so I mean, and that's all we've ever had Hey guys, continuing this talk on idealism. Um, there's been some um, sort of quite you know strong conversations I think amongst um, some of our you know most intelligent and sort of well-informed members, and I think that's fantastic. I think um, I mean I, you know it, it's great that people's views are developing and evolving and so on and so forth. And you know as we said elsewhere, there is no final right answer on any of this stuff. Okay. Um, but I, I'm going to um, sort of talk a bit more about idealism, what it means to me, what I think its central claims are, and why it's so convincing to so many people. Um, there's been some interesting analysis from from Mike lately that's kind of uh, you know raising sort of certain questions about some of uh, certainly some of the arguments used to support idealism and whether in fact they, well, I don't think it's it's in any sense to, to completely reject it as a possibility, but I think. You know, there's areas of, of, of the argument that, that probably need tightening up or reinforcing. Mm -hmm. But it's also to say, I think it's important to note that, um, you know, Mike, so Mike, Mike, again, you know, raised, raised some fantastic and interesting um, problems to consider. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems to consider with something like idealism is that it isn't just about a reasoned position. It's about some kind of, you know, if, you, if you're an idealist, it does involve a certain kind of belief, right? And whether I'd compare that with sort of religious belief or mystical belief, I, I don't know, because I think that, you know, philosophy can only take you so far and arguments can only take you so far. But there's a point at which it has to be about sort of intuition and what you feel is right. And, and maybe that's to do with psychedelic experiences, giving you a, a glimpse of a kind of non-egoistic uh, experience of consciousness, which kind of suggests... Um, you know, profound interconnectedness between all things and this sort of holistic view of stuff. And, you know, there might be something like that or meditation, you know, hinting at this possibility that consciousness can do stuff other than this kind of material egoistic stuff. And so, you know, there are many paths into this kind of place. And one of them is philosophy and one of them is, tech I mean, as, as, B as Bernardo Castrup um, shows, you know, th th there are so many problems with materialism that it at least points the way towards something, um, you know, like idealism or maybe panpsychism or something like that. So then, then you've got to make a choice between these alternatives. So, look, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, materialism has failed to give an account of um, the nature of reality. So it, it, it's just, it's, it's blundering now. And the limits of its um, descriptive capability are being reached, right? And so this is why, you know, we've got scientists and philosophers now going after trans-materialistic um, or post-materialistic um, models, right? So, you know, assuming that there are things like, 
you know, there's there's stuff like agency behind all things. Mike Levin's um, analysis of Mind Everywhere program, sort of literally finding evidence of cognition in some of the most basic systems you can imagine. And no wonder, therefore, that he um, he talks so much with BK. I and mean, I think they part company in various metaphysical uh, areas. But um, ultimately, um, you know, Levin's sort of, uh, bi- you know, bio-philosophy, if you like, um, it lends itself quite keenly to an idealist interpretation or potentially panpsychist, right? Because, I mean, you know, if we're saying, well, agency goes all the way down to these subatomic particles, potentially, then that would suit the likes of Philip Goff, who like to... Um, suggest that consciousness exists in all things so these so these particles do have standalone existence but they have like a kind of mental field around them or something right i mean i think that um there, there are problems with that and these are sort of well documented because it doesn't really offer it still faces the explanatory gap it's, it still faces problems with emergence and so on and so forth it doesn't really change much in a way you just say well everything's conscious right um i, I <laughs> You know, I, I I just think that's just basically wrong, and I can point to Hoffman's interface theory. I can point to, you know, um, Schopenhauer. I can point. To, I can point to anyone that understands the notion that the world is a world of appearances, right? Um, so you know, these particles, neurons, whatever it is you want to talk about, these are representations of some underlying phenomenon. For me and other idealists, I'm still still not convinced we're completely wrong, but equally, I'm still not convinced we're completely right. You know, that's. I think philosophy always has to have an open door to challenges and questions, right? I mean, some of them you might get a bit tired with. I mean, you know, I think, okay, we face this again and again and again and again. Are we flogging a dead horse here? But then there, there are people coming into this debate and this, um, you know, proposal of idealism. And they're quite, quite new to it. And so, so what is idealism saying? So idealism is saying that there's, first of all, there's no evidence for the existence of anything other than mind. Right? <laughs> I mean, for me, that's an extremely powerful position because we've only ever experienced mind, okay? So to suppose that there's some other, you know, ontological substance beyond mind is, that's a leap of faith, right? We can still do physics, we can still do chemistry, we can still do evolutionary biology, we can still do freaking Carl Friston's free energy principle within a minded universe, right? It doesn't matter, you know, we can still describe the regularities that exist in, in the cosmos, um, but I, the, 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 the advantages of idealism are that it opens your mind to possibilities beyond these rigorous kind of um, models that the physics has offered up, for example. So, and we're finding that in high energy physics, where they're saying, well, this space time model, which everyone kind of clings to, isn't working for us anymore, right? So we've got these non spatial, pre spatial, or a spatial, a spatial temporal mathematics that allow us to do better predictions of these quantum phenomena, right? So, so doing it, so, so getting, getting rid of this kind of sp- spatiotemporal manifold helps them do better maths and better physics predictions. So even in those most technical areas, we're, we're sort of saying, well, you know, space-time is kind of how things look, but it's not how things are, right? So, you know, again, that lends itself to an idealist interpretation. That's why Hoffman uses it so um, cleverly to support his position, right? Um, so, you know, there's the first thing to say. Um, you know, we've only ever experienced consciousness, so why suppose there's anything else? And so you're kind of turning the hard problem of consciousness on its head and saying, actually, no, it's a hard problem of matter, right? Because, um, you know, what is matter? It's, um, it's, what we, it's stuff we experience, yeah? It's stuff going on. You know, my, my interaction with matter happens nowhere other than in my mind, than in consciousness, Yeah? And so, really, the hard problem is the hard problem of matter to, to explain what this stuff is and what it's representing. What is, you know, what is the, the matter in itself beyond my perceptual grip on it, right? And that's, what, you know, I don't even know whether that question can be answered, but I've, I've had some hints from some of the guests on the show. So, Chris Fields, um, you know, he made the point, he said, look, you know, um, physics and philosophy or science and philosophy working together are very good at showing us what we don't know. <laughs> but is that, in some sense, a step forward towards knowing? I think it is. Yeah, and I mean, this came up um, in the sort of Chelsoff conversation the other day. I can't, there's quite a few of us involved in this, I think. But um, it was, you know, can, can we have any metaphysical knowledge? Can we truly do that? Can we traverse that gap between, um, you know, our experience of the world and, 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 you know, supposing that there is a gap? Because in, in some sense, in an idealist interpretation, there is no gap. If all there is is mentation... That's all I'm experiencing. So every single phenomenon that I encounter is a result of some sort of agential um, phenomena, right? 
there is nothing which is not agential. I mean, I've talked about in this um, Everything is Alive Parts 1 and 2, which I keep on plugging. It doesn't seem to help much. <laughs> but, um, you know, I offer this suggestion that um, everything is alive. There is nothing that is not involved in the dance of and the orchestration of, of organisms. And um, I, I would, you know, I, I, would I be prepared to debate that? I don't think I'm smart enough. But again, this is what I was trying to hint at earlier. You know, arriving at an idealist belief isn't just about logic. It's not just about tight technical argumentation. And I think tight technical argumentation can get you a hell of a long way and it can kind of cross off, cross off the, the ridiculous options. But I don't think it can cross off that intuitive feeling that you gain, that, that the sort of intuitive understanding that consciousness is primary. That, you know, there, there is um, so just such a wealth of literature written about this idea that, you know, consciousness emerged from complexity in the universe, right? So there was no mind to begin with, right? And then suddenly these minds emerge from these complex interactions of matter and energy and so on, right? And it's just beginning to be more and more shown that that's utter bullshit. Right? There had to be some agency in the first place. I think there has always been agency and there always will be agency and there are a, a myriad different manifestations of agency and a myriad different types of mind, mindedness. Um, in some sense, the Twitterverse analogy just serves, serves me so beautifully and, um, I, you know, fundamentally that is really truly what's going on. If I was going to answer the question, who are we? We are those nodes in the in the Twitterverse network, right? That's the best we can come up with, the best explanation we've got. I mean, Chris Field's um, physics as information processing talks about the kind of Markovian approach approach to physical phenomena, right? We've got so embedded in this kind of um, almost sort of Newtonian materialist model of, of um, phenomena that we <clears throat> we suppose that things like distance and time and um, you know spatial relations and stuff are actually freaking real, right? So we think there really is this kind of extensible distance between us and these distant objects, whereas Fields is saying, no, you just do away. That's an, that's an assumption, that there is this extensible sort of space-time manifold. That is an assumption. So get rid of all the assumptions. Pare it down to the most certain aspect. Right? And the most certain aspect, you know, one, one certainty is that there is this field of interaction between agents as a transfer of information across the boundary, and there is a limit, there is, you know, this is not an infinite boundary, and it's not an infinite exchange of, of information. So um, you could sort of look at it as a kind of bit rate or a bit transfer, right? Maybe a copying process or a kind of um, compression, right? It, I mean, it has to be compressed because uh, it's not infinite. So, so um, you know, we just got to melt, melt into an entropic soup, as Bernardo Cashman calls it, you know. So... <laughs> We, we know that the world is a, negotiate, a negotiated impression of what's out there, whatever out there even means. And, and you know, is there, there is no out there. There are just other minds, right? So, um, think of it as kind of an example of that. So, when I look up and see the sun, I don't believe there's any spatial distance between me and that object. I think there's some sort of agency there, extremely powerful, influential agency that affects neighboring agencies. But... Um, there's not some space-time manifold, yeah? I mean, sure, if I get into a spaceship and fly to the sun, I'll, I'll melt, right? I get that. But again, that's just the interaction between agencies and exchange of information across a boundary. There doesn't have to be any spatial difference to be able to make the... to understand these interactions and relations. You can, you can predict how these systems will unfold by, you know, even once you've done away with the spatio-temporal relations. Right? I mean, you know, again, the amplitohedra gives us an example of that. You know, they, they do not exist in space-time. They're not space-time objects. Yeah? They're, they're these kind of um, sort of n-dimensional sort of obelisks, Hoffman says. And at the moment, we're kind of, you know, aping around them like on the 2001 A Space Odyssey. You know, when they see this object, they don't understand. And we're kind of like, the, you know, physicists the apes at the moment, but we're just we're beginning to kind of understand what they do. And they give us better, more elegant predictive mathematics for things like scattering amplitudes. We can do better physics with them, right? And what does that tell you? That tells you that we're not living in a 3 or 4D space-time manifold, right? And, you know, you can talk about Herbert space, you can talk about quantum mechanics, string theory, and give me any freaking physics model you want. Any, any model you want. And I'm not buying any of them. I will not buy those models. They are not the territory, right? They will be replaced by new models. You know, all this furore about quantum mechanics and all oh, quantum mechanics can be used to explain consciousness and so on and so forth. It's bullshit, right? 
Quantum mechanics is just the latest physics model. It will be superseded by something else. What do you think Wolfram's doing? Building another model that seems to respect this with what looks like a kind of computational aspect to, to reality. I don't know whether I agree with him on that, but it's an interesting approach. And he's already managed to sort of, well, he, I mean, I'm talking to him soon, so I can challenge him on this. He, he seems to be unifying relativity, quantum mechanics. He can explain black holes. But space-time is an emergent property in his system. It's not fundamental, right? And, <laughs> you know, he's one of the most intelligent people on the planet. He built uh, Mathematica. Right? You know, most physicists, mathematicians, programmers, they use this, right? It's, it's world-renowned. <clears throat> this guy is a beast when it comes to um, analysing and trying to understand things. And he has concluded that space-time isn't fundamental. It's an emergent property of this Rouliad, as he calls it, um, which I suppose is a kind of a replacement for, the, you know, inverted commas, the laws of physics, right? I think. Um, and, it, you know, it, he, he gives us relativity as an emergent property to such a degree of accuracy that it's used as a, a validation tool for people doing um, relativistic physics. <laughs> you know, his, his, mod, his, his computational model is a benchmark for um, expertise in relativity. So, you know, high-fiving that. So what, you know, what does this tell you? It tells you that models will get replaced by new models. So we can't... You know, maybe they're scratching some of the, maybe they're pull, peer, you know, pulling back some of the layer, metaphysical layers. Maybe they are, but we put, we invest far too much um, stock in the ability of these models to tell us about about the world. What they do tell us is that they're not the world; they are models, and we've got into this very confused territory called materialism, I would suggest, and also now just sort of getting the even the, the even worse variety, scientism which is the belief that science will give us all the answers and, and fully describe the world. I mean, I think um, Gogol would have to say something about that. No system can completely describe itself, right? So there'll always be this uncertainty, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, so, yeah, so idealism, the claim, everything is mind. And I think um, science is kind of suggesting that, because it's, I mean, it's obviously, and I think, actually, I've got to step back and sort of be on, a bit honest here, because, you know, beating up materialism and physicalism isn't proof that idealism is correct, right? It's proof that materialism and physicalism aren't um, correct in terms of their, their, their ontologies, right? So <laughs> that's not enough, yeah? And um, so, you know, what, what, is, what is the argument? Really, fundamentally, what is the argument? I think the argument is just that it makes more sense than the others. <laughs> and, you know, in some sense, that's all we've got as a guiding uh, principle. I mean, you know... Um, Wittgenstein talks about these language games, right? And, you know, this is the problem being that um, meaning and understanding of the world is refracted, if you like, th or filtered through these prejudice sort of discriminatory kind of language systems that we have that reinforce particular worldviews, just in the very language itself. This is part of what um, Thomas Kuhn was talking about um, in his structure of scientific revolutions, that the experiments, the models, the math, the language... They are built around a particular paradigmatic understanding of the universe, right? So they continuously reinforce that to the point where any other um, metaphysic just gets pushed into the long grass, right? So anyone that suggests there's anything other than a clockwork materialistic universe in the last sort of 30, 40 years would just get kicked out of school. But obviously that's changing now. Um, thank, thank the Lord, because it means we can do better science. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is what Mike Levin, you know, this idea that philosophy doesn't belong in science and philosophy is just science we don't understand properly is absolute bullshit, right? And Mike Levin confirmed that he has philosophical workshops, right? And his laboratory, scientific laboratory, where philosophy is at the foreground, the centre of everything they do. Because philosophy allows you to ask those, or some people consider juvenile or infantile, daft questions, but they're always the deepest and the hardest to answer. And, you know... Um, you know, so, so yeah, there it is. Philosophy is in the driving seat now, at long last. It's come out of hiding. And it's going to help rationalise and um, calm, I think, the situation. Because um, people are getting grouchy, aren't they? I, you know, I, I think well, one of the issues with philosophy is that it also um, it, it becomes quite personal. In perhaps a similar sense to things like religious beliefs become personal. People sort of internalise these belief systems and then perhaps they they aid in some way in giving meaning to the world, it certainly does with me. Um, and, you know, to, to sort of perhaps have that position criticised can be quite hurtful. I think, of course, depending on the way in, in which it is done. But um, I think, f for me, I want to hear my position critiqued. I want to see what's wrong with it. 
if indeed there is. And I think there are issues with it. Of course there are. There is no complete final theory of everything, right? So, so I think when I say I'm an idealist, I think what I mean is that um, I believe idealism to be true. Yeah? Whether I throw myself off a bridge, you know, to, to prove it, you know, but I, I, I do believe it to be true because I haven't seen any better explanation so far. I mean, I know that I need to do some more reading um, and I, I think that it's important for idealists to face critiques of idealism. And I think that's healthy um, and it's part of the journey. And, you know, it could be wrong, right? And that, 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 that is what distinguishes philosophers, I hope, um, even the idealist philosophers from, say, um, you know, f fundamentalist re religious people, right? We, we're not saying this is it, this is the final answer, here's the book, read it, read, read um, Castro and Co, job done. Right, you get you know get a little badge that says I'm an idealist and I know it to be true and you know it's 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 not like that. It's a conversation. Um, I mean, I think that it's also true to say I think there's an ethical dimension to this as well. There's a spiritual dimension to this because materialism has failed us in terms of its approach to humanity and the way we should manage each other. If you can convince the people they're clockwork robots with no meaning, they're a hell of a lot easier to manage than if they think they're minded, spirited, uh, free willing beings that can create the world. Right. Um, if you believe that you're just the creation of some hyper god that sort of you know created you in his image and stuff, you, you know it takes away a certain amount of responsibility. So, both religion and science have done a great job in ruining our self-image. Right? And um, <clears throat> so, I think there are dangers associated with the materialist paradigm. I'm just going to spell it out. I don't think it's a healthy paradigm for human success. And um, I, you know, am I right in saying idealism offers a better one? I, yeah, I think I am. Yeah, because it suggests that, that everything is minded, everything is purposive, everything is agential. We're beginning to see evidence across the board that that seems to be the case, right? Um, I mean, everyone's seen that, well, I hope everyone's seen that like video of the little single cell. This was once a, um, a frog, well, it was a few frog skin cells. They call them xenobots, right? These are unique beings, okay? And they cooperated, they started eating, d deciding what to eat, got tactics, they worked together as a, co a collective. These are skin cells. Right? So, for millions of years, these skin cells have just been skin. Right? And this shows that a gentle material like cells can do what the frickin' hell they want within, obviously, the realms of logic, right? Um, and then, they, you know, they started reproducing and you know, creating duplicates of themselves and um, gaining a number and doing new tasks. And, and there's a video of one of these guys going through a, a completely still liquid maze. And it's cornering perfectly, it never touches the size, it's got, it's got awareness, I'm telling you, it has volition. Um, it changes direction, they can't explain why it did that. Immaterialists yeah, might go, oh, there was just some sort of chemical signaling going on, or something, you know. But this is pure, you know, as far as, it's pure, it's pure liquid, there's no kind of foreign bodies or anything in that, you know. For some reason it made a decision to turn around, and again, it did it beautifully, you know. Um, that, um, that, that, that little entity had... had um, had a plan, right? It had a it had a world model. It had a self model. It made a decision, right? And you might say it's some sort of clockwork information processing, and I say that's bullshit. You know, I'd say that clockwork information processing thing you're talking about is they is the model, not the territory. It just keeps coming back to that same goddamn thing that maths is a formal representation of the world. It's not the world. I mean, there's obviously the question of where maths comes from, and that's an extremely deep and interesting one. You know, where does that normal distribution live? Where does logic live? It's this free gift thing, isn't it? Like you only need to define the two points of the triangle, you get the third one for free. Right? Um, so, yeah, I think the universe is agential. So idealism seems to make sense to me because it looks like it's the behavior of, all of this is the behavior of, of, of minds. And you know, it's, it's mad to suppose there's anything other than minds if that's all we have evidence of. So anyway, let's hear some criticism of this. <laughs> I mean, I know this isn't the final word, this doesn't settle matters, but hopefully some of the newer members can hear, you know, certainly what my views are on, on metaphysics. Um, I think that we just, that there is nothing that is not involved in the, or the orchestration of, of, of mind and, and life. So there it is, extremely exposed now. Take some shots, let's, <laughs> let's hear where I'm wrong, yeah? And, um, you know, we, we had this, I, I posted something about debates. It's a bit of a dumbass post, really, because it was pointed out by several members that some of the dichotomies I put up were false, but it was, gets the conversation going and actually, actually an interesting debate in itself. You know, what do we actually mean by creationism, Darwinism, so on and so forth? I and mean, I think, 
you know, I, I think sometimes you know creationism isn't just the claim that um, some kind of supernatural entity, you know, um, hyper entity like God did it. You know, I think um, creationism could also kind of tie in with some kind of panpsych panpsychist metaphysic. I reckon because you could say that you know things were created deliberately, but they were created deliberately by these self aware, you know kind of agents the sort of particles and stuff so um yeah 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 it's interesting stuff um i mean i think that idealism you know i think this is possibly some of the trouble that people have with it right is that it looks like it opens the door to everything that's woo and maybe it does right and maybe there's something in some of this woo i mean it's unscientific you know but um it's not necessarily you know of, of, of interest to me but i don't have an issue with it because i think there is some truth in all of these these mystical traditions I think spirituality is a thing, right? Um, I think there is a transcendence, there is a great other, don't know what it is, none of us do. Um, I like Hoffman's kind of mathematical approach to, to modelling God and reality and stuff, and, you know, he calls it the whole. He says we can't even call it one. It seems like one to a local, for a local slice of the experience of it, but it, he would describe it as a whole. And I think that's quite an interesting, subtle distinction that you could probably write an essay about, but... Um, you know, because one implies some kind of identity, doesn't it? Whereas actually, you know, again, Gödel come to comes to coming to the table here. You you can't have a sort of self-describing system, completely self-describing system, because you have to incorporate that self-description in the description, and then you end up in a sort of infinite regress. But um, but look, um, I'm an idealist, um, but of course, you know, Chelsoff welcomes all isms, and that's what we're about, really, is to have these conversations. Um, to introduce people to new and interesting ways of thinking about the world. Um, you know, as Kastrup says, um, you know, idealism seems to give us a chance for a deeper sense of meaning. Because, of course, if, if, if the materialist account of life and death and so on is true, then there is literally nothing of this experience and this journey that I've been on remaining. Because, obviously, if mind is identical with brain processes, my brain ceases, there's no mind. There's no mind. There's, your consciousness, according to the materialist, depends on a physical substrate. And that is just precisely the thing that idealism denies. Um, it just says there is no physical substrate, there is just consciousness. I mean, you, you know, they still face issues like, well, where did the fucking consciousness come from? Well, nowhere, it's just always been. And, you know, that <laughs> that's a big claim. Um, but it, again, it just seems like a more common sense interpretation than takes something like the Big Bang. I mean, well, the Big Bang is crazy when you think about it. We're saying, oh, there was nothing. And then there was this freaking explosion and nothing. Well, I mean, that goes, it goes against the grain of all sorts of kind of um, problems with you know, causation and, you know, and I mean, again, maybe this is just the limits of human understanding. This is interesting, actually. So um, I think it was Castro up again. I'm always quoting him. I'm a bit of a fanboy, right? And um, they, they showed that um, there could, you know, there can be constraints on mathematical understanding or the possibility of mathematical understanding, right? Because they had these rats um, doing mazes, and they managed to show that the rats were able to um, understand the distinction between even and odd numbers. They had math, right? Because um, there was mazes set up where you had to take every second um, left or something to be able to escape the maze and then get the food and so on. Um, and there were ones where it's every third or there are even numbers and odd numbers. And they showed that the, the rats had an understanding of number. You know, they, they, they kind of proved it. There must be some internal representation that involves number and computations of numbers, right? Um, but then they did, did it with prime numbers. Right? So they set up a maze where you'd have to follow, you know, you'd have to take every um, prime number or something in the sequence to be able to escape the maze. And they couldn't do it. So they'd be in the maze forever, right? So that shows it's possible to have mathematical understanding, um, but that there can be constraints within it. Right, so you know, it begs the question: you know, what kind of mathematics can't we do? And that's that's just fascinating, isn't it? Um, but anyway, so I hope that's of interest to people. Idealism is the claim that everything is mind, and it sort of seems to be the inverse position to materialism, which sort of claims that everything is material process. Right, and there it is. I'm still one. I know I've got a lot of do a reading to do, Mike. I will look into these 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 proposals in more detail. I've had very little time lately, but I'm still comfortable with this position. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing any critiques. Cheers. Bye.